All right, so for today's notes, we are going to go over some more notes on mitosis and a cell cycle. And we're gonna finish this up. And then on Friday, we'll talk about cancer, which is related to mitosis and the cell cycle. Um, today's notes are mostly gonna be focusing on mitosis, the phases of mitosis, and then um, also the regulation of going through the cell cycle. And the regulatory processes that we're gonna talk about um, regarding the cell cycle are also like very similar to any regulation processes inside of um, cells because it's related to signaling and communication between cells causing cells to do things. Um, for example, replace, re uh, reproduce, grow, or um, they're going to be doing their specific function. Um, so we're gonna go into that. Don't forget that your chapter nine summary and learn more are due on Friday. That's at midnight. So again, it's not on Sunday anymore, it's on Friday. And let's talk about the lab first, because we're not actually gonna do this lab. Um, we don't have the time, nor do we have the resources to do it. So we'll just talk through the information, since it's some good information. So I'm going to basically go through these questions. And in your notes, you don't have to write the questions, although it would be helpful too. But I would like you, after I discuss each question, to pause and write down um, a summary of what I said or your own answer. So number one, how do you develop from a single celled zygote to an organism with trillions of cells? How many mitotic cell divisions would it take for one zygote to grow into an organism with 100 trillion cells? So this is actually simple math. It's kind of weird to think about that, but you start off when the sperm and the egg meet at conception as one single cell. And that single cell zygote ends up becoming you. And you have a good, couple trillion of cells. And so you're starting from one and you have to get to a couple trillion. And so when one cell splits, it becomes two. And when two cells split, they become four. And when four cells split, they become eight and so on and so forth. So technically the base multiplier of this problem would be a two. And then the power of how many times you have to multiply by two by two by two by two is going to go need to end up being a hundred trillion as this problem is stating. So you would basically just log base in a calculator. So log base two with 100 trillion equals X and that would be your answer. And so just as a hint, it's gonna take a lot of divisions to reach this number, right? It's taken many years. And you know the rumor that like every seven years, your cells have been totally replaced on your skin. Well, you also have to think about the cells that are inside of you too, that are getting replaced because you know, they're doing their job, they're gonna use up all their energy, they're gonna use up all their functioning and then they're going to die. So they have to be replaced as well. And then you also have to be making new ones to grow. Okay, so do this math and then you can uh, write actual answer. Okay, number two, how is cell division important to a single cell organism? Now, either you can pause and answer or you can wait for me to discuss and you can summarize my answer, remember. So cell division is important to a single cell organism because without division, they can't reproduce. It's simple, right? In multicellular organisms, um, cell division is mostly for fixing and growing, but in single celled organisms, their cell is their entire organism. So for example, like bacteria, when they split, it's because they're reproducing and making a clone of themselves. So number three, what must happen to ensure successful cell division? There are a couple things, and we did mention them at the beginning of the do now for um, the previous day. So one of them would be that you have to have two copies of DNA. And if you don't have two copies of DNA, that means the other cell is not going to get DNA. And so what is the point of dividing if you're going to make a cell that doesn't work and doesn't function and technically isn't a cell? The other thing is that you have to have double the organelles, right? Because if the cell has um, the DNA and the instructions, but it doesn't have the machinery to make any of its products that it has to make, then it is an unfunctional cell. And it's still technically not really a cell, right? So you need the ribosomes, you need the Golgi bodies, you need the endoplasmic reticulum, you need the mitochondria. If you're a plant or an autotrophic cell, you need chloroplasts, right? All those things have to be doubled in order to be split evenly across the cell as it divides into two, okay? There are other things, for example, there has to be enough cytoplasm to share and there has to be enough membrane to pinch off as well. So number four, how does the genetic information in one of your body cells compare to that found in other body cells? This one's a little tricky, so I want you to think about it first for a second. So all of the cells in your body, other than your uh, eggs if you're a girl and other than your sperm if you're a guy, all of the cells in your body have the exact same genetic information in them. And that's kind of weird because you're like, well, they don't do the same thing. And I'm like, I know, right? Your eyeball cell has the same exact DNA in it as your fingernail cell. Now, does that mean there's fingernails in your eyeball and there's eyeballs in your fingernail? No, 
It just means that even though they have the same instructions, right, all of the code inside of the nucleus is the same, the actual parts that are being read and turned into products through the central dogma are different, okay? So you can choose to read different sections of your instructions to make different products. And that's what's happening. So in your eyeball cells, they're made to um, basically reflect light so that they can diffract it and have your brain interpret it, right? But that has to be a different set of proteins than what is happening and being produced in your nails, which is structural and protective, right? So the genetic information is identical because it is your cell. So it has your DNA but the parts that are being read and being used to make proteins and make products are different. So number five, what are some advantages of asexual reproduction in plants? So plants actually do this cool thing called alternation of generations and animals that are um, heterotrophs, heterotrophs don't do this because we can't. And then um, bacteria can't do this because they can only really do asexual reproduction. So plants get the benefit of both. And so they alternate between doing asexual and sexual reproduction because sexual gives them recombined new genes and they get new combinations and new variations and potentially new mutations. Asexual reproduction takes a lot less work and effort because you don't have to find a mate. You don't have to make a bunch of seeds to send off. You don't have to make a bunch of pollen to send off and hope that it works. Asexual is basically just cloning. So cloning takes a lot of less energy and takes a lot less time and has a lot less risk. Okay, so there are three advantages basically of doing asexual reproduction and plants get the benefit of both sexual and asexual reproduction. Number six, why is it important for DNA to be replicated prior to cell division? Well, like I said earlier in number three, if there's no DNA, the cell doesn't have any instructions to make any products or proteins. So then it's an empty cell. It can't do anything, right? It's not even a cell at that point. Number seven, how do chromosomes move inside of a cell during cell division? Well, during cell division, during prophase, they're getting formed into chromosomes from chromatin. So they used to be like spaghetti, and now they're getting coiled into those X-shaped chromosomes. And then during metaphase, they're moving to the middle, right? Metaphase, M, middle, middle plate. They're all moving to the middle and lining up in a nice single file line in mitosis. And then in um, anaphase, they're getting pulled apart, A, anaphase, apart. They're getting pulled apart by the spindle fibers, okay? and then you'll see them pulling apart. So originally they were kind of attached like this. And then as they get pulled apart, they get pulled apart like this since the spindle fibers are connected to the centromeres of both sides. And then they end up on the opposite ends of each other um, in the cell. And then the cell will pinch in in the middle and then they'll separate. And because the chromosomes all move to the opposite ends, they'll be going to the correct side or the opposite side of the um, uh, cells to be one set in each new cell. Um, number eight, how is the cell cycle controlled? What would happen if the control were defective? Well, the cell cycle is controlled by cytokines, which are kinds of protein. Um, I guess you could relate them like hormones. They're basically protein signals that either activate or deactivate genes to say, hey, we're going to continue going through the cell cycle, or we're going to pause, and either we're going to kill the cell because everything went wrong, or we're going to fix up something and then come back and check again. So, um, if the control though were defective, then either cells would be replicating like crazy and going too fast through the cell cycle when they're not supposed to be, wasting resources, wasting energy, and then also causing things like tumors and cancers because they're just replicating too much where they're not supposed to. And then also it could possibly cause the cell cycle to not continue. So then cells would be dying without being replaced. And that's actually closer to what happens when you get older, right? The reason why you have um, like organ failure or heart failure when you're older, it's just because the cells are dying and not getting replaced. And so once they're not replaced, your organ starts to fail because all of the cells are no longer working slowly. Okay, so hopefully you've answered those. I should see those in your notes when I see them submitted. So here is the information that I want you to kind of read through a little bit. So just pause and read through cell division, mitosis, and meiosis. I know it says meiosis, but we're actually going to talk about meiosis in the next chapter and not in this current chapter because right now we're focusing on cell division for mitosis in the cell cycle. Meiosis is for sexual reproduction, and that's going to be a little closer to genetics. So pause and read through this. I'm going to ask that you pause um, on this slide as well in order to kind of annotate and write down small things, but I am going to talk about it too. So here, cell division in eukaryotes is more complex, right? We talked about in prokaryotes where it's binary fission and it's just reproduction, but it's basically cloning. It requires the cell to manage a complicated process of duplicating the nucleus, other organelles, and multiple chromosomes. This process called the cell cycle is divided into three parts, interface, mitosis, and cytokinesis. 
Interphase is separated into three functionally distinct stages. In the first growth phase, the cell grows and prepares to duplicate its DNA. In synthesis, S, the chromosomes are replicated, which is the DNA duplication. This stage between G1 and the second growth phase is where this happens, right? We said that it's kind of weird that it goes G1, something else, and then G2, because intuitively we just go G1, G2. But if you do S phase between G1 and G2, then you actually are in the correct order. And then after the S phase in G2, the cell prepares to divide. In mitosis, the duplicated chromosomes are separated into two nuclei. In most cases, mitosis is followed by cytokinesis when the cytoplasm divides and organelles separate into daughter cells. This type of cell division is asexual and, and important for growth, renewal, and repair of multicellular organisms. And it's basically the same thing as um, binary fission in uh, single-celled organisms. So here's a diagram that you can see, and then there's a short kind of blurb about each section or each phase. So I want you to pause and write a few sentences to interpret these figures. So obviously M right here is talking about mitosis and you go through interphase, which is G1, S, G2, mitosis, G1, S, G2, mitosis. And as you're going through this, you have relative concentrations of these two signaling, um, sorry, these two signaling molecules. And one of them is called MPF, and one of them is called cyclin. And cyclin does sound like a lot like cycle because it helps regulate the cycle. So tell me where they are peaking, what part of the phases they are peaking at, and maybe why they are peaking at that certain part, uh, phase inside of the cell cycle. You can also look at this image right here, where you can uh, just kind of read through, where it says new cyclin is building up, blah, blah, blah. So you're gonna start with cyclin and CDK, and then you're going to combine them into MPF, which is the, uh, hold on. MPF is mitosis promoting factor, okay? So you're going to be combining them to form MPF. And then as they separate and then cyclin declines, then you're going to have to start the cycle all over again. So these are present as separate entities combined into one entity and then just CDK is left afterwards. And if you look, this actually directly coincides with the parts of the cell cycle right here. So before you enter or exit G2 and enter mitosis, that's when the uh, uh, MPF is being formed. And then after mitosis, you see that CDK is broken apart from cyclin and cyclin is degraded and broken down before it starts again. Once you get past G1 and S inside of G2, you're going to actually start again. So these are uh, MPF production is peaking in relation to one specific part of the cell cycle. And I kind of want you to, you know, tell me that, what that is. So as a summary of that, cell division is tightly controlled by complexes made of several specific proteins. These complexes contain enzymes called cyclin-dependent kinases, right? Remember, if you look at the CDKs right here, which is the cyclin-dependent kinases, they don't work unless the cyclin is connected to it or um, uh, bonded to it. So without cyclin, CDK is just floating around and just chilling. It can't do anything. It can't trigger any reaction. It's just moving around. Um, and these CDKs turn on or off various processes that take place in cell division. So they're the on and off switch. Once they are attached, then they'll either turn a gene on or turn a gene off that causes um, you to proceed or to stop inside of the cell division. CDK partners with a family of proteins called cyclins. One such complex is mitosis promoting factor. So the name already tells you that it's promoting mitosis or it's going to start mitosis. So MPF is also called maturation promoting factor. Um, and that contains cyclin A or B and cyclin dependent kinases. So MPF is literally just cyclin plus CDK. CDK is activated and uh, when it is bound to cyclin, interacting with various other proteins that in this case allow the cell to proceed from G2 into mitosis. So it's moving through a checkpoint here. The levels of cyclin change during the cell cycle. In most cases, cytokinesis then follows mitosis. So if you notice that after mitosis, the MPF drops the cyclin and it goes back to just being CDK. So CDK is reused and reused and reused, but cyclin when it's not present is actually broken down because it's not useful. Um, because also if cyclin is always present, then it's always going to be bound to CDK and then it's always going to become a mitosis promoting factor and cause the cell to go through a cell cycle and cleave even maybe when it's not supposed to. So cyclin being absent is a good thing while the cell is either in G0 or going through interphase at a timely manner instead of rushing through it. 
As shown in figure three, different CDKs are produced during the phases. The cyclins determine which processes in cell division are turned on or off and in what order by CDK. In each cyclin, as each cyclin is turned on or off, CDK causes the cell to move through the stages of the cell cycle. So you can see that there's a CDK right here across G1 and halfway through S. There's an S phase CDK that is activated uh, close to the end of G1, and it is mainly active all the way until the end of anaphase and mitosis. And then you see the mitotic CDKs got to prepare a little bit early. So they're going to prepare starting in the G2 phase, and then they're going to go all the way through until um, you get back to the G1 phase again, starting over the cell cycle after mitosis is gone. And then you would be starting your G1 CDKs again, and you'd be back to here. So there are three different kinds of CDKs, and they all get activated by cyclins. Right? So they have to be activated at different times in the cycle to make sure that they are um, triggering the right reaction to move the cell cycle along. Without CDKs, without cyclins, then you don't get the MPF for, my to um, for mitosis to occur. Right? You don't get the combination that causes the uh, organelles to double. You don't get the combination that causes the DNA to be um, instructed to duplicate. So all of these things are triggered by these on and off switches that are related to cyclin dependent kinases, right? And then when cyclin is actually there, then they're actively doing their job and turning on that switch to continue moving through the cell cycle. Cyclins and CDKs do not allow the cell to progress through its cell automatically though, okay? There are three checkpoints a cell must pass through, the G1 checkpoint, the G2 checkpoint, and the M spindle checkpoint. At each of the checkpoints, the cell checks that it has completed all the tasks needed and is ready to proceed into the next step in its cycle. So cells pass the G1 checkpoint when they are stimulated by appropriate external growth factors. For example, platelet-derived growth factor stimulates cells near a wound to divide so that they can repair the injury. The G2 checkpoint checks for damage after DNA is replicated, and if there is damage, it prevents the cell from going into mitosis. Because if the DNA is damaged and you still decide to make it into a new cell, either that cell is going to be dead because the DNA is badly damaged, or it's going to have severe mutations in it that mean that maybe it can't even do its job to begin with. So it just makes sense to and cut over, uh, start over. Um, the M spindle metaphase checkpoint assures that the mitotic spindles or microtubules are properly attached to the kinetic cores, which are the anchor sites on the chromosomes. They're in the center of the chromosomes. Um, if the spindles are not anchored properly, the cell does not continue on through mitosis because if you don't connect them properly, you can't pull them apart properly to go to the opposite ends of the cell to then be split apart and evenly divided into the new cells during mitosis, right? It makes a lot of sense that you would want to double check at these important parts. The cell cycle is regulated very precisely, okay? So these three checkpoints are very, very important because they make sure that when you're doing the cell cycle, you're not making any huge mistakes that will cause cells to be um, wastefully made when they can't even function properly. So based on this kind of description, you can always pause on this part if you need to or come back to it. I'm gonna actually ask you to attempt to mark out where you think the checkpoints are inside of the cell cycle. So you're basically going to take and draw a big circle that is the cell cycle, okay? And you're going to portion out where it's gonna be interface for about, you know, most of the circle. And that interface is gonna be broken down into G1, S, and G2. And then for mitosis, which is the rest of the circle outside of interphase, you're gonna have P, M, A, T for prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then you're gonna have a little sliver for cytokinesis, okay? After you have all of those labeled, you're going to at least write one function inside of each of the separate sections because they all have a main process that is happening inside of them, even each of the little PMAT ones, okay? So if you need to, you can draw a little line outside of the big circle that you have to label um, the little sentence descriptor outside. Then you're going to draw a stop sign. You're gonna technically draw three, okay? You're gonna draw a stop sign at each of the three checkpoints and state what they are checking for as this paragraph talks about, okay? So again, if you need to pause and reread this, go ahead and pause and reread this so that you are drawing your checkpoints at the right place. I will be checking these in your notes, okay? Don't forget to also draw and define G0. We've seen a bunch of diagrams now. You wanna go back and look at uh, the diagrams to see where G0 branches off. I'm gonna give you a hint. It's close to right after mitosis and cytokinesis happen, okay? And then I want you to, at the very end, at the very bottom of your notes for this page, at least, to write a few sentences to compare binary fission with the cell cycle. I want at least one difference and one similarity. And then what kind of cells do uh, binary fission and what kind of cells do cell division? Okay, here are some more notes. Now, these are some more general information. So 
In mitosis and cytokinesis, we got to know some more details. So in eukaryotes, DNA is in very long threads. And in order to get these threads into the shape of chromosomes, you have to condense them a lot. And so you're going to wrap them around these histone proteins. And they're little round proteins that, as you can see, they look like beads on the screen. And they get wrapped around, um, sorry, the DNA gets wrapped around them and then coiled tightly together so that it's condensed and compacted together in the shape that we can actually see them under an electron microscope. Normally, DNA, you can't really see under um, a microscope because it's just loosely threaded around. And it's a really, really, really thin thread. So when you put the DNA and the histones together, that's when you get chromatin, okay? In interphase, DNA is not very compact. So if you're looking at a cell and you can't see its DNA, you can't see its chromosomes, that's because it's at some point in interphase. But if you can see the chromosomes inside of the cell or the nucleus of a cell, that means that it's going through mitosis probably, or it's right about to, because then it's compacted and getting ready to pull apart. Um, right here, like I said, but during mitosis, the DNA condenses or coils very tightly into distinctly visible chromosomes. So that's when you'd actually be able to see it. So it's kind of cool that if just by looking at a cell, you can tell kind of what part of the cell cycle it's in. So chromosomes are kind of interesting too, because you would think that, hey, if an organism is more complex, it's going to have more chromosomes. And if an organism is less complex, it's going to have less chromosomes. And that's not necessarily true because our idea of complexity is skewed towards animals because we are animals, okay? So chromosomes, fungi, for example, yeast have 32 chromosomes, but the garden pea only has 14. The potato has 48, right? The Southern adder's tongue fern actually has 1,320 chromosomes, even though it's just a plant, right? And then if you look at animals, we already did the Drosophila ones when you drew them in your posters. They have eight. Humans have 46 and goldfish have 94. So if you talk about complexity, is it really true that the more complex an organism is, the more chromosomes it has? And just by looking at this, if you are willing to admit that you are less complex and, than a goldfish, then I guess you could be true. But the answer is that the complexity actually lies in the amount of code and the type of code that's hidden in the DNA and which ones are regularly used and expressed. It's actually not about the amount of code that you have in the DNA. And this is a picture of a human karyotype. And when cells are in mitosis and they are the chromosomes are formed, they can actually be seen and pictures can be taken of them um, under an electron microscope. And then scientists will often parse them out and split them up and kind of organize them into their uh, chromosome one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way to 22. And then the sex chromosomes X and Y. Girls have XX, boys have XY. And you can see which one of the chromosomes are bigger. You can see which ones are smaller. You can see if there are defects in the chromosomes. If chromosomes are missing arms or legs that are causing um, you know, mutations that affect a person. And so it's kind of interesting to look at these. I've actually been looking at these ever since I was about like 10 because my mother actually studied these as her professor at Georgetown University. And so it's kind of boring if you've done it for a long time, but it is cool because you can see the stripes on here where the genes are represented in density and they're marked out because all the marked ones are the genes that we have actually identified as humans and figured out exactly what they are related to, what features, what characteristics, even what behaviors they're related to. And inside of a cell, the picture is actually going to look something like this. So that's why they have to cut out each individual piece and place them onto this diagram where the numbers are labeled to be able to see more specifically how they are comparing to each other. Um, like I said before, Drosophila only has about eight chromosomes. So they have two X's, two second chromosomes, two third chromosomes, and two fourth chromosomes. And they are a lot more simple than the ones that we have but they carry enough information to create life and to have variation to be creating different phenotypes of different eye color, different wing types, different body colors as well. So a little bit more vocab. The diploid or 2N number includes two sets of chromosomes of each type. So if you notice right here, um, the Drosophila is diploid right now because it's got two of each type of chromosome, right? There's four types, but there's eight total because there's 2N or two times the the haploid number. Humans only have 23 types of chromosomes, but we have double that amount in our somatic body cells. Only in sperm and eggs do we have haploid, which is just one of each type, right? So um, when you actually do meiosis for sexual reproduction, instead of lining them up one by to one on the middle line in metaphase, they actually line them up in pairs and then split the pairs apart first before they split them again from pairs into individuals.
the haplite or N number for human chromosomes is 23. So when you get 23 from your mom and 23 from your dad, you get back to getting 46 in total for your body cells. So um, every nucleus in your body cell has 46 chromosomes, and then it's usually uncoiled, so it's not even in the shape of chromosomes. But in your sperm, if you're a boy or if you're um, a girl in your eggs, then you have 23 chromosomes in each of those cells. At the end of S phase and interphase, the DNA has been duplicated or replicated and sister chromatids are identical, okay? Duplicated, replicated, synthesized, they're all used interchangeably. So if you see them on your test or if you see me using them or see or hear me using them, they all mean the same thing. It just means copied, okay? Sister chromatids are attached together at a single point, which is the centromere. So if you see chromosomes and you draw them as a crisscrossing X, that's actually wrong. They're closer to actually being more like um, two separate uh, little bars that are just bent and touching in the middle and then attached with a centromere in the center, okay? During mitosis, sister chromatids will separate. Each sister chromatid becomes a daughter chromosome, which is distributed to the opposite nuclei. So if you look here, even though there's two big ones and two small ones, one from mom, one from mom, one from dad, one from dad, they're actually going to all line up individually in the middle and all get pulled in half from the sister chromatid separating before they are reformed into nuclei. So if you look here, it's actually still going to be um, the full set of chromosomes, even though they're only going to be one sister chromatid. That's why they're duplicated again and become the X shape before you're going to go through uh, mitosis again. And so here's a diagram of being able to see what mitosis looks like in a real actual cell. And it's kind of cool to look at them because early prophase, you can actually see um, the aster forming for where the centrioles are going to be forming and pulling with spindle fibers. Um, and it's really weird because this is also stained with blue because humans' the body cells are like this weird light beige tan color that you can't really see, so it's stained with blue. And you can see over here that there's spindle fibers inside of this cell and that in pro-metaphase or right before metaphase, the um, chromosomes are starting to line up on a metaphase plate or the center line of the cell. Um, in plants, you can see them as well, um, but there are uh, there are no centrioles, right? So the things that produce the spindle fibers that attach the chromosomes at their centromeres, the centrioles are do not exist in plants. So centromeres, sorry, centrioles are special to only animal cells during the process of mitosis. In metaphase, you can see that they're actually perfectly lined up in the middle and that there are spindle fibers forming both in plants and animals, right? And they're going to pull them apart in anaphase, A apart anaphase. And you can see that they are getting pulled apart with the spindle fibers toward the opposite ends. And then in telophase, they're going to start reforming into um, just regular DNA instead of being in the condensed form. And then the nuclear membranes are going to start reforming around them as well. So this was a quiz that I actually gave to my students last year and they worked together as a class and they organized them into the correct order for um, uh, the cell cycle and they labeled kind of what was happening. Instead for y'all, I want you to write down the numbers and then tell me what is the phase of number one and then what is happening in a short phrase. And then after you have identified the phase and a short phrase for each of them, I'm gonna ask that you then go ahead and tell me the actual correct number order. So for example, the correct number order, randomly, I'm just saying a random order, would be like seven, three, four, eight, two, nine, five, six, one. And that would be the full cell cycle. So you just wanna tell me that order after you've identified each of their phases and then given a short description. That is all for today. So I will be looking for this and I'll be looking for some of the answers earlier on in this notes video in your notes when I am grading them for extra credit.